Welcome, Weirdos. I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Here you'll find stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, the strange and bizarre, crime, conspiracy, mysterious, macabre, unsolved, and unexplained. This is a Fireside Frights episode, where once a month I come to you with the, without the fancy production, no creepy music, it's just you, me, and this campfire with whatever Mother Nature wants to send our way for background noise. And all stories on Fireside Frights episodes are submitted by you, the listeners of the podcast, my weirdo family. So if you don't send me stories, I don't have them to tell. In fact, what you hear tonight makes up the entirety of the stories. Once I'm done with tonight's episode, I have no more stories. So if you want to hear your stories, uh, please send them in for the future Fireside Frights. You can do that by going to WeirdDarkness.com and click on Tell Your Story. If you're new here, welcome to the show. While you're listening, you can be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, my newsletter, to enter contests, to connect with me on social media. Plus, you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression or dark thoughts. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. And by the way, before I get into tonight's episode, a huge thanks to everybody for their patience and their understanding over the last few days. Uh, if you probably noticed, uh, I've been do, doing a lot of uh, Dark Archive episodes, um, partly because of the health issues, but mostly because I was kind of in a bind and I needed to get an audiobook done. And uh, the only way to do that was to concentrate on that and not do the podcast. That, that that happens very rarely, but it was a sort of an emergency situation, so I had to take care of it. And if you're one of my patrons, you know exactly what book that was, because I was sharing the audiobook chapters with you as I was recording them. Okay, let's get into it. Bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the weird darkness. Our first story tonight is from Stockton, and he says, Hey, Darren, I've been listening to your podcast close to three years now, and I have thoroughly enjoyed it. Thank you for the passion and excellence you put into your work. Well, now that's out, that uh, that's out of the way, I'll get to my story. I'll begin by saying that while I love listening to others' stories of the paranormal, I'm a skeptic. I tend to think that there is a scientific explanation to each narrator's story, and they are simply unable to see it. I've had a few circumstances in my life that are indeed strange, and I'd like to share them, eventually but each could possibly be explained as something that's unusual rather than paranormal. I wish that were true for all my stories, but there is one that still creeps me out to this very day. It was 2006, and I was a bright-eyed college sophomore making my annual drive to school. To simply call this trip a drive is an understatement. It was more of an adventure. You see, during this time, I was hard up for money and found that with the exchange rate, an education in Canada would be much cheaper than here in my native California. I'd enjoyed my first year at the school and was entering my second. My carriage was a manual, uh, manual silver 2000 Ford Focus. I had no cell phone or GPS, and my only guide was a crumpled up Rand McNally nap with a few tears along the creases. Boy, I remember those days. <laughs> Oh man, I thank God for GPS nowadays, I'd, otherwise I'd get lost coming home from work. Okay, anyway, uh, my only company was the scenery and a collection of CDs I kept in a disc binder. For you Gen Zers listening, a CD is Spotify on a disc that only held about 12 songs and skipped if you scratched it. The trip was a grueling 30 hours of window time, and if the weather took a turn for the worse, it could easily become a 60-hour trip. I didn't mind, though. I enjoyed these adventures. It was a time for me to experience unknown roadside diners, friendly locals, and eccentric city attractions. Yeah, I'm looking at you, medicine hat, and your world's largest TP. During this particular trip, the weather was excellent. I drove with the windows down, and the sweet American air filled my car. Certainly there was much to enjoy on these trips, but they definitely had their long periods of boredom. Miles of absolutely nothing but pavement and dirt so much nothing that seeing a lamppost would have been something to write home about. I was in Nevada, traveling on Interstate 80. It was about 2 a.m., and I hadn't seen any sort of civilization for hours. The night was unusually dark, and there was no light pollution to speak of other than the car's headlights. 
The darkness didn't bother me, but it is something that had caught my attention before I saw it. The road was straight as an arrow, and approximately 200 yards ahead was a large pair of yellow, glowing eyes. Seeing something other than road brought some much-needed excitement, especially since I was in the middle of listening to my Counting Crows album for the third time straight. I began lowering my speed, intent on pulling over to get a better look. The eyes were massive, so I was enthused about what kind of animal it could be. As I got closer, the animal began to be illuminated by my headlights. It was on the shoulder of the road, right beside the fog line. I was still far enough away that I couldn't tell what it was, but my guess was a deer due to the size of the creature's eyes. I was slowing down to about 10 miles per hour and I noticed the way it was moving. It was on all fours and it was hopping. Certainly not a deer, I thought, knowing that deer don't hop. I then thought that maybe it was a massive rabbit. I was now 50 yards away and then noticed that this thing was pure white like milk. As it became clearer for me to see, I saw that it didn't have a distinguishable nose. For a brief second, I thought maybe it was a large white rabbit just hopping along the highway in the middle of the night. That thought was extinguished the moment I saw more clearly. This wasn't even close to a rabbit. It was a freaking person! No clothes and pure white skin. Its body was gaunt, with arms about as thick as a shovel's handle. The eyes were about three times too big and glowed yellow in my headlights. It had no nose or even a mouth that I could see. It looked forward, not at me, but directly in front of itself. It placed its knuckles on the ground in front of it and pulled itself forward with little hops. It moved slowly and paid no attention to me as if I wasn't even there. I continued to slow and get closer because I, I couldn't believe my eyes. I hoped as I got closer my eyes would clear and see that this was indeed an animal, but the closer I got, the more sharp and distinguished its features became. This thing wasn't animal or human. I wish I could say that I was brave enough to stop and stare, but I pulled away from the shoulder of the road, dropped into second gear, and hauled ass out of there. After I passed the creature, I checked my rearview mirror, worried that it was chasing me, but all I could see was black. For the next hour, I drove much faster than was legal and could not shake the dread that came upon me the moment I saw what it was. What I saw was real. I was not tired, I didn't wear prescription glasses, my windshield was clean, I wasn't going too fast, nothing can explain what I saw except that it was actually there. Want my advice? If you're ever driving in Nevada between Lovelock and Battle Mountain, Go during the day. Thanks again, Darren. You rock, brother. Signed, Stockton. Oh my gosh, what a story to start with. Your your description kind of sounded like um, uh, uh Lord of the Rings, um, Gan not not Gandalf. That's the <laughs> Gandalf. What an idiot. Um, Smeagol. Um, uh, but but uh, but Smeagol has the the mouth and uh, and the nose and everything. But I mean, it it kind of kind of struck me that way. And he's more gray than white. But anyway, still that would that would be freaky. That of course that'd also be freaky if you saw Gandalf in the middle of the road. But that would be for a different reasons. Okay. <laughs> anyway, thank you very much for the uh, story, Stockton. I really appreciate it. Very very creepy way to start up, start up our our uh, fireside frights. This next one comes from Greg. Hi, Darren. I love your podcast. It keeps me company while I spend many hours on the road away from my family. I have a host of stories I could share with you. I grew up in a house where every one of my family members encountered something unexplainable. I was also an EMT for a while, and although, uh, and although never experienced anything paranormal while on call, did witness some very macabre situations. Anyway, back to two separate stories I'd like to share. The first is a story of my grandpa, who was my best friend. He loved all his grandchildren immensely and had a very special relationship with each of us. For me, it was fishing. When I was a kid, he'd show, my, he'd show up at my house and tell my mom that I needed a day off from school to go fishing with him. It was great. It was, um, excuse me, I said, he said it was great, and some of my best memories are spending time with him. The man smoked cigars like a chimney. Dutchmasters were his brand, which probably led to his health issues later on. 
My grandpa spent the last few weeks of his life in a hospital due to those health issues. I remember his last day on Earth with us. My mom and his sister were at the hospital keeping watch with my grandma. I'd gotten into bed and was laying there trying to fall asleep. I remember my bedroom door was open to the hallway. I looked over and saw my grandpa standing in the doorway smiling at me. He waved and walked down the hallway, leaving behind the smell of a Dutch master cigar. I broke down in tears. Not long after, my mom called the house to tell us Grandpa had passed. But I already knew that. He'd just come to say one last goodbye. My second story is one of the paranormal experiences I had while driving in my childhood house. It was weird. Oh, while living in my childhood house. That makes a lot more sense. I don't know why I read that as, dri as driving. Uh, anyway, um, it was weird. In high school, I worked on a dairy farm. It was a decent-sized operation that milked around 300 cows twice a day. The morning shift, which I worked, clocked in at 3.30 a.m., which means I was usually up at 2.45 to get to work on time. I remember one morning I was sleeping when my dad came busting into my room yelling, you better get up, you're late for work, like jumped out of bed and saw him head downstairs. All our bedrooms were on the upper level. I got dressed and went downstairs to get some coffee and breakfast. I noticed it was only 1.30, an hour and 15 minutes before I had to get up. I was ticked. I started to look for my dad to ask what was going on, but he wasn't there. I was confused because I remember seeing him go down the stairs, but he was nowhere to be found. I went back upstairs and looked in his room. There he was, snoring away. I woke him up and asked him why he got me out of bed so early, and he, his reply freaked me out. I didn't wake you up. Why are you even awake? Don't you have to work early today? I swear it was my dad who woke me up and then went downstairs, but he was asleep in bed. Did I see my dad's doppelganger? Your brother in Christ, Greg. Greg, I uh, that that last your question at the end. Did I see my dad's doppelganger? I don't know. I don't know about doppelgangers showing up like that. I, I've heard of doppelgangers being like elsewhere in the world, like you'll see somebody and you'll think that it's that it's uh, your dad or your sister or even you, um, and uh, and it's it's not unexplained. But I've never heard of. Well, I guess I guess there have been stories about doppelgangers showing up in the same in, in the in, in the same house. Okay, yeah. I don't know though. That's uh, that's odd. Either that or you had the the most vivid dream ever. <laughs> Speak speaking of last night, I was having a weird dream. Um, and I, I think it had something to do with the fact that I was also listening to the radio uh, at the same time. But um, normally, when, when you're asleep, you're not supposed to be able to move your muscles. Somehow I did. And this has happened to me in the past. Uh, but I was I was uh, dreaming that I was in a high school gymnasium and they were playing soccer in the gymnasium, but they were only using half the gymnasium, only one goal. And instead of a soccer ball, they were using a football, like a, an, an American football. They're like from the NFL. At the same time, the quarterback, I guess, for lack of better words, he was telling the news uh, in a newscaster's voice. And I th that's why I think it's that came from the uh, radio, because I know that voice. Um, it's it's the voice of Mike Scott from, um, from AM560 uh, in Chicago. I know that voice. So, but so I'm I'm assuming that I was listening to the news somehow in the back of my, you know, in, in the background that was seeping through into my, <laughs> into my dream. But can you imagine watching a soccer game, it, regardless of whether or not they're using the right ball for it anyway? But watching a soccer game and uh, or a football game or whatever, and the and the guy was sitting there, I mean, never missed a beat, just kept on telling the news as if it was just like everyday occurrence, no big deal. And then the, the ball ended up coming up. I was on, on the, in the bleachers on like towards the top. And for some reason I was laying down covered up, which might be because I was in bed at the time dreaming this, maybe that's why. But anyway, the ball came up and um, I reached for it because it was, it was like one, one step down from me that, that, that it landed. So when I reached for it, I found myself leaning over the bed uh, when I, because I woke up at that point, and I was about to fall out of bed because I was reaching for an invisible ball that wasn't there, and I was half off the bed reaching down, 
weirdest dream ever, and I don't know why I'm sharing that with you, but anyway. Oh yeah, that's right, because uh, Greg saw his got doppelganger. So it would have to be a very, very vivid dream uh, to see your doppelganger, but uh, you know what the difference is between a dream and reality, Greg, so I have no, no explanation for you. And I told that story, and now I'm kind of kind of thinking maybe after I'm done recording this, I need to go back in and, and delete that story <laughs> because it made no sense and has nothing to do with Weird Dark. I'll leave it in. I'll leave it in. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> let me get a, a sip here real quick of a drink. Tonight, I'm just drinking regular water. Well, that and it's, uh, it's got some Splenda sweet tea water enhancer in it. Just trying out a different some, some different drinks rather than just the, the sparkling waters just just for, for the heck of it okay this next story comes from rachel hi absolutely love your podcast i'd like to share a personal true story of my own with you when my daughter was about two in 2010 she started having night terrors after we moved back home to my parents home now when i was a child i had many odd experiences in the home all stemming from a night where my father opened the back glass door after we heard repeated phantom knocking. As a superstitious kid, I begged him not to open the door, but he insisted. We never found anyone outside, yet since that day, we have had odd happenings. Things moved from where they were left, doors opening on their own, and seeing family members when they were not yet home. Hey, there you go, Greg. There's your doppelganger right there. Looks like Rachel has one, too. Anyway, now my daughter's night terrors started out with her simply waking up crying, but quickly they changed to her not only waking up screaming, but she would be terrified for 15 to 20 minutes later, often looking down the, ha the uh, hallway toward our shared room and then randomly jumping and resuming screaming as if she'd just seen something. I shared my concerns with my parents as I was a 20-year-old new mom. They told me it was normal and it would eventually stop. But for the next three months, things just got worse. Each night when she awoke, my, uh, uh, we would leave, each night she awoke, we would, oh, okay, I'm sorry, I lost my place there. Each night when she awoke, she would head to the living room to rock in the recliner. Eventually, the dogs started waking and acting strangely, pacing and raising their hair near the hallway to the bedrooms. And then one night, about four months after her night terror started, my daughter awoke in the middle of the night screaming, and when I jumped out of my bed to pick her up from her toddler bed in the corner, I swear I heard something growl at me. I screamed for my life and quickly turned on the bedroom light. Now, my door was shut, so, so uh, had it been a cat or a dog, they would not have left the room. However, I found no animals in the room, nor under the bed or in the closet. For the next two nights, I heard this growl whenever I would pick my daughter up out of bed. We started sleeping in the living room. After a few days, I decided to take action. I saged the house and spoke firmly that whatever was there was not welcome and that she was my baby. I also made her a dream catcher and tied in four pieces of turquoise at each directional point, north, south, east, and west, all the time praying in my head for safety for my daughter. The very day that I hung that dream catcher over her bed, she slept through the night, and all was well for nearly a year. After about a year, my father called me at work uh, while he was watching my daughter, saying that she'd come from her room crying about a monster and the dogs were acting oddly. I asked him to check if her dream catcher was hanging up. He said it wasn't. When I arrived home, the dogs were still pacing and guarding the hallway. I found my daughter's dream catcher under a blanket under her dresser. I again saged the house and the dream catcher, eh, and the dream catcher and then hung it back up. Within 10 minutes, not only were the dogs acting normal, but my daughter resumed playing in her room. To this day, I don't know what was in that house, but I believe it wanted my daughter, and I believe we had uh, allowed it to continue, had we allowed it to continue, it would have eventually harmed her. Dang, Rachel. So I'm not into saging the house, um, we're more into blessing our house, but that is creepy that not only would the dream catcher have fallen down, but that you found it under the dresser, under a blanket. Nothing just falls into that position. That was that was placed there. That was hidden there by something or someone. Scary stuff. I'm glad that you're not having any issues uh, now. Man. Um, 
for for people who I and I'm not really familiar with the Dreamcatcher. I know what a Dreamcatcher is, but I'm not familiar with using them in that way. So uh, if anybody has Dreamcatcher stories that you want to uh, throw my direction, or if you've got stories about using holy water in your house or sage, whatever, send them my way. We actually need more stories for Fireside Frights anyway, um, and that'd be an interesting thing to, uh, to to read about. Okay, this next story comes from Lisa. She says, "Hey Darren, first." I want to say I literally stumbled across your podcast while trying to find documentaries on Apple about three years ago, and I have been a fan since. Here's my true story. When I was younger, my grandmother used to collect what she called China dolls. She had a huge cabinet full of them, and she also had some hang off of her bedroom walls. She loved these dolls and talked to them often, almost like they were human. It's kind of creepy now that I look back on it. So maybe two or three times out of the week, me and uh, and three of my uh, other cousins would have to spend the night over at our granny's house so that she could watch us and take us uh, to school while our parents worked. She'll feed us, bathe us, have our pallets made in the front room so we can all sleep together and watch TV since one of us was terrified of the dark. We'll laugh and play until we finally got sleepy and drift on off to sleep. One night, I woke up in the middle of the night to use the restroom. It was really dark with um, uh, with a little light on from the kitchen that dimmed on the cabinet, and it, filled with, uh, it was filled with dolls in the dining room. Me, being the brave one, I just hopped up and started walking towards the restroom, passing the cabinet and looking at the dolls along the way. I finished taking care of my business, then started to make my way back to the front room. And that's when I noticed that some of the dolls' heads were turned but earlier they were all facing forward. I glanced at it, but shrugged it off as me still being half asleep. The next morning I got up, looked at the cabinet, all the heads were facing forward, so I laughed and thought to myself, you had to be dreaming. Or so I thought. Fast forward to later that day. My cousins are outside playing, my granny's on the porch watching them, and asked me to grab something for her out of the room, and I happily ran up the stairs straight in the house. Once I got in the house, I started to walk past the cabinet. As I walked, it felt like I was being watched. So I walked a little faster, hurrying to my grandma's room. Now, I remind you, in her room, she has the same kind of dolls hanging from her walls. Going in there just intensified the feeling that I was being watched. And the room felt different. I can only explain as the feeling you get when you know someone's behind you, like you can feel it. I ran, out the, I ran out the house so uh, so fast, and late that night my mother came to get us, but before leaving, my grandma gave us all three of these Raggedy Ann dolls. You know, the dolls with the red yarn hair. The one that we were so happy that we played with every day after school. A few months had went by, and my grandma got sick and left us. This is when things started getting scary. I would leave the doll on my bed and would come home, She'd be in my chair, or on many occasions, I'll have it hanging on the wall and she'll be somewhere else. At first, I thought nothing of it, since my mom straightened up while we, were, while we weren't home, but as it kept happening, even on days I knew my mom wasn't home, I built up the nerves to ask, Hey, Mom, are you moving the doll around? Her response was a simple no. She could see the confusion on my face, but I proceeded to just say, Okay, maybe I forgot I took it down. It's now Friday and my cousins are over for our slumber party. We all have our dolls. We're playing in my room with the door closed, and then we noticed it got really cold out of nowhere. The TV is becoming fuzzy, and then it just snaps off. We were all about to start screaming, and that's when we see what looked like an image of my grandma flash on the TV screen and then go back out. We ran out of the room, screaming, bumping right into my mom. We told her what happened, and she basically told us it's in our minds. We just missed Grandma. Her passing was still fresh. We all looked at each other and agreed that that had to be it. That there's no way to see her on the TV. She made us a light snack and sent us on our way to bed. When we got in the room, the dolls that we kind of threw anywhere from running in fear were all sitting on the bed next to one another. It's safe to say we did not sleep in that room, and those dolls were later donated to a church. I'm not sure if my grandmother may have anything to do with the dolls, but I can say until this day, I have a slight fear of any porcelain and Raggedy Ann dolls. Thanks for allowing me to tell my story. I wish many blessings on you and yours. Please, never stop doing your podcast. 
Work is no fun without them. Well, thank you, Lisa. That's a very, very, uh, very nice way for you to end that. I appreciate that. No plans on my stopping the podcast. Um, in fact, I was even talking to a, a friend of mine the other day who works for Spreaker, the people that I actually host the podcast with. And uh, she was asking, you know, what I'm going to do in the future when I stop podcasting. I said, I'm, I don't, I'm not planning on stopping. This is this is a career I can do until like I'm 95 or 105 or 125 if I la if I live that long. So long as I have a voice, I can keep doing this. So uh, no no plans to stop in the near future. In fact, I've got plans to expand on things, uh, which you'll hear about more in the future if we decide to go that direction. But going back to your story, Lisa. Um, a couple of things popped out at me. One, the Raggedy Ann doll. Um, most people, well, most people listening to the podcast probably do know, but most people in the world don't because the uh, the movie Annabelle is based on a real life doll. But the doll they show in the movie is not what the doll looks like. The real Annabelle doll, the real life one that's behind glass, you're not allowed to touch, is a Raggedy Ann doll. That kind of creeped me out there just a little bit when you said that that was that was the doll that uh, had been giving you some some strange things. Uh, something else I was thinking of. You said that your grandma used to talk to the dolls like they were actually real people, and that makes me kind of wonder about the whole the whole uh, tulpa idea that you believe in something hard enough, and if enough people believe in it, that it could be something that actually manifests and becomes reality. That's not scientifically possible, but there are so many things that we don't understand when it comes to science, so you never really know. To us, it just looks like magic. But if you're continually talking to an inanimate object and you're treating it like it is animate and like it understands you and maybe that it could even reply to you, who knows? After a while, you got to wonder if maybe something that maybe there is something to that. I really don't know. But it, it's interesting, though, that you had those Raggedy Ann dolls, all three of them. I mean, yours obviously was met was, you know, you know, freaking around with you, but freaking around with you. That's a, that's a weird way of putting that. Sorry. Uh, it was scaring you. It was freaking you out. That's what I was trying to go with. Um, but the other girls, you know, you never mentioned whether they had any issues until, of course, they all three came together for your sleepover. And that's when they all sat together on the bed after you you dropped them and ran out of the room. So anyway, strange things, Lisa. Thank you very much for sharing your story. I appreciate it. Okay, this next story comes from Tarian. I've been a believer in the paranormal for close to 30 years. You ever had a moment in life where you find yourself saying, oh my God, this is really happening? Well, my story was the scariest thing that ever happened to me. I remember it being a regular day. Normal stuff, breakfast, school, lunch, playing like any other kid in the neighborhood. But as night fell upon us, that is when my life changed. Now, we lived in a duplex, which is a house plan that has two living units attached to each other. Ours was a side-by-side -side with only two rooms apiece. Our parents had one room. I'm sure she means only two bedrooms apiece. Uh, our parents had one room. My brother and I had the other room. Altogether, there are three of us. So we had two bunk beds in the room. I slept on the top bunk farthest away from the door. My mom told us good night and turned the light out. As I laid there thinking, why can't I sleep, I stared into the void of darkness. I heard two voices I have never heard before talking. The first voice said, there he is, and the second voice said, let's get him. Starting, for, uh, starting from my feet, I could feel this energy surge over me until I couldn't move. I was able to look around and saw nothing, but something was holding me down. I was so terrified at that moment, I cried out for God in my head and asked for forgiveness. I had no idea how to pray. As I was crying out to God, the strangest thing happened. The best way to describe it is to take a blanket and pull it over your head and slowly pull it down. Once I was able to speak, I screamed, jolting my younger brother out of his bed to turn on the lights. As the light touched me, I was able to regain feeling in my whole body. I explained what I just went through, but he was only six years old, so you can imagine it went in one ear and out the other. He turned the lights back off, but I was afraid of sleeping, so my plan was to try and sleep with my mouth open, just in case it happens again. Oh boy, did it happen again, even faster than the last time. 
but I was able to make noises loud enough for him to hear and turn the lights on again and nothing uh, turn, uh, turn the lights on again, but nothing happened after that. Fast forward 25 years, I was listening to a podcast talking about sleep paralysis, saying if you hear or see something that your event was demon-related. After hearing that, it sent chills down my spine. Well, that's it for me uh, for now, Darren. Thank you for being a bright spot in the darkness. Keep up the good work, and thank you, listeners, for all your support of Weird Darkness. Thank you so much, uh, Tarian. I appreciate that. And you were listening to that podcast talking about sleep paralysis, saying that it was demon-related. I don't know if that was Weird Darkness or not, but, but that is what I believe. Um, I know that there have been sleep paralysis issues. When I, I'm reading your story, and I just I know it's sleep paralysis the way you're saying it, but um, I believe in many cases there is a demonic element to it. I'm not going to say that all sleep paralysis um, situations are that way, because uh, I really don't know about all of them. I can tell you about the one that I had, uh, and it was very much uh, like what you were talking about. But it went a step further, and I actually saw the demonic entity in my bedroom. But it was the same. I couldn't move. I could see, but I couldn't move. I couldn't talk. Um, and the only thing that happened, the only, the only way I was able to get out of it was to to pray for Jesus to save me. Uh, being a born-again Christian, that's, that was my first instinct. And that's what finally released me, and I was, and, and I was freed. But that feeling of of evil was so overwhelming that I'm convinced that it was demonic. I don't think that kind of, that kind of feeling, that, that's, that such strong presence of, of evil can be explained away scientifically. Um, I might be wrong, but I'm just saying this is just what I believe. I'm sure there are other issues, uh, where people have sleep paralysis and it's not demonic, I know it has been explained by science in, in many cases, but in those few instances where it's similar to what you're talking about and what happened to me, I really do. I, I believe that there's a demonic um, aspect to that. Not a demonic possession, because that's when they actually take over your body, but a demonic oppression where they actually influence you from the outside of your body. That, I truly do believe, is what happened to me. This next story comes from Danny. In the first story of mine read on your show, I told my experience with what I believe to be a Sasquatch, and although it was my first experience as an adult, with adult memory, adult feelings, and adult responses to a terrifying, strange situation, it was not my first experience, nor would it be my last. My first experience was at the age of seven. We had just moved from a small village in midwestern Ontario, about an hour away, to a small hobby farm in the middle of the country. It was an odd house. It was essentially two square units from other places brought to the property and joined by a five-foot hall. Our barns were the same, an old, an old-time worn steel A-frame barn and a newer square steel-clad horse barn in, in black with white trim. Almost the nicest building on the property. It was certainly more square than the house. Watching my dad and grandpa trying to do drywall in a house without a straight wall in sight it's a horror story that I'll save for my contractor buddies. <laughs> That's great. Um, it was my first summer in the house. I, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm picturing a house with no straight lines, uh, no no straight walls inside. I, I can't imagine. Somebody's got to take, if you if you can get a picture of that house, I want to see what you're talking about. That, is, that, this, that just doesn't even sound possible. Okay, anyway. Um, it was my first summer in the house. I was still getting used to it. It had a weird feeling to it. That's how I summed it up back then weird feeling. Now, as an adult, I know that feeling to be anxiety. I have an explanation to the feeling that place had more easily now as an adult, even easier if you suffer from tinnitus like I do. To me, there are no quiet places. I hear that grenade-went-off sound effects sound all day, to a lesser degree than the movies, of course, but it's there. All the time. Imagine going camping, no more peace and quiet. It gets oppressive, heavy, disquieting, frustrating. There's always something in the background. Well, that's the way this house felt, like a dark blanket hung over the place. I didn't notice it at first, and even though the feeling unnerved me, I knew it must be the unfamiliarity of the place. The fact that now there was only one yard light out front of the hydropole and 
not a small town worth of lights around our house, wasn't lost on me at seven years old. It was dark. Not to mention, now I heard cows lowing in the dark at the stamp of a hoof, the wind blowing through acres of corn. It was eerie at times, but I still preferred the starry night over being in that house. It was a Saturday morning. I got up with my alarm at 9.30 because the Smurfs were on Global at 10, and I wanted to make oatmeal first. Yes, I did a little cooking for myself at 7. My mother had to teach me because I was trying to do it uh, any time her back was turned anyway. I guess the career I guess the career I picked. <laughs> so there I am lying in bed, staring at the wood paneling in my bedroom, making faces out of the whoops and whirls of the, of the uh, wood grain and knots in the paneling, slowly waking up and coming to my senses. It's a beautiful, sunny day out. My curtains were open, and the sun was streaming down warm and cozy on my legs and across the door to my room. Perhaps that's why I first noticed it. About four feet up the frame, on the left side of the door, a head very slowly slid into view. An ear gnarly and wrinkled, dark, tanned like old good quality loafers came first, with a cheek deeply scarred and stretching following. And stretched, that is, following. I remember being frightened of the detail in that face and yet feeling like I couldn't focus on it. I closed my eyes tight and opened them again. There it was. It almost looked uh, burned or mummified and desiccated. It looked at me while warm sunlight fell across its face and it smiled. Black eyes stretched at the corners and a too wide, thin smile crept its way over its face. My father was, well, he had a twisted sense of humor. He would have been glued to whatever fail video was out if he were still alive. Most of his beloved childhood stories and memories involved him and his brothers beating the crap out of each other for fun. Anyway, he once dressed up as a scary clown and crashed a toddler's birthday party by running around, banging on the windows, and laughing maniacally. So I immediately thought the smiling, terrifying nightmare coming more into view every second was just my jackass father pulling his latest attempt to make me crap my pants. Dad, stop trying to scare me. I know it's you, I said loudly, still sure that it was my dad, but my skin still crawled. My terror was complete when I heard my father's voice from his room just down the hall. What? What's wrong? I heard him say down the hall as that thing smiled wider, leering at me. I shrieked as realization hit me. I screamed from the soul. My mother came into my room like a Valkyrie, her hip passing through the head of whatever night spawn was hanging in my door. She pulled me in close and asked me what was wrong. I told her what I saw. There was a burned man smiling at me in my door, Mom. She turned and stiffened but said nothing. The doorway was now empty. My superhero mom had chased it off and I was back in a sunny room, safe. She left briefly, whispering to my father in the other room. I was still nervously sitting there in bed, scared to look at my door when I heard him pulling on pants in the other room, his belt buckle jingling as he, as he tugged them hurriedly up his legs. I watched him pass by my door carrying a baseball bat. He searched the entire house, saving the basement door right next to my room for last. I only ever saw it once more. I changed rooms because of that incident. I just couldn't sleep there anymore. My new room was just down the hall on the opposite side, right across from Mom and Dad's room. It was a comfort. Then one night I saw it again. I woke up sometime in the middle of the night. Something had woke me up and I was kind of miffed that I had been woke up. I looked to the hall and there it was. It stood there in the hall in plain sight. It didn't bend down looking at me from a doorframe. No, it stood there in plain sight and it smiled like a thin zipper being drawn open. To this day, I still wonder at my response. Like I said, I was miffed for being woke up. Back then, just as I am now, I am a complete angry bear when woke early or quickly and this night my child's Scottish temper protected me. Oh you, get lost, I'm trying to sleep, you asshole! My seven-year-old self rolled over back to the door and went back to sleep. I was never bothered again by the apparition. Well, I never saw it again. My father and I could feel it sometimes. The hair would stand up on your forearms and that feeling of being watched would spread over your body. My dad and I would look at each other and nod. My mother didn't notice anything. She told me that she hadn't felt it at all. 
had never seen a thing. Fast forward another seven or eight years. I'm in my middle teens, and we're sitting in our living room with friends and my parents. They were talking about ghost stories and the local places that were talked about in whispers and avoided. That was when my mom started to tell my story that I relate to you now. If you remember, I had only told her there was a burned man in my doorway. I hadn't gone into more details. I hadn't described anything more about it. I wanted to forget. So when mom started to describe the thing, the hair lifted on my arms. Mom, I didn't tell you that, I said, trailing off as she looked at me and fear came over her face. You didn't have to, Danny, she stated quietly. We stared at each other the whole time I held you, she whispered quietly. That house always felt heavy. The feeling of being watched never really left, but never developed into anything more than what's been told. We did renovate the place. We took out the little five-foot hall and fully connected the two halves of the house. The place was okay after that. Lighter. No more being watched. No more hair standing up. But it did teach me one thing. There is some weird things in the darkness. Wow. Okay, Danny, that is a great story. I'm kind of miffed at your mom for uh, seeing the creature while she's holding you and yet never revealing it until so many years later. She had to have told your dad, though, I would think, because, uh, because otherwise, why would he have picked up the bat and started looking around? So if, if you're scared that you maybe saw somebody but then your mom bursts in and doesn't see anything, then he would probably chalk it up to you having a bad dream. But if she told him that, yes, she saw something, that's when he grabs the bat and starts looking around. So I think maybe she did tell your dad. They just decided that they weren't going to tell you for some reason. Maybe they didn't want to confirm that something was there because that would scare you even more. I, I don't really know, but man, that is that is creepy. Um, and it, it kind of makes me wonder if maybe that hallway was what was uh, was what was either possessed or haunted or whatever. Because you said that you saw the demon in the hallway, you saw it coming out of the hallway into your room, like in in the in the doorway, and that you never saw it again once the hallway was removed. So I'm wondering if maybe the hallway, in some strange way, has uh, something to do with it. Great story. Thanks for sharing that. This next story comes from Aubrey. Hello, Darren. I'm listening to your show about hitchhiking. Your stories about phantom hitchhikers moved me to share my own story. I usually don't share this story, as it is very formulaic, but this is 100% true. About 30 years ago now, I was driving home when I saw a young lady walking towards me along the side of the road, who was crying hysterically. I stopped to see if she needed help, and she asked for a ride home, saying that she didn't live far. She refused any other kind of help saying she did not need the police or hospital or anything like that, so I offered to take her home. She got in and told me she was going the opposite way of which I was headed, so I turned around. A few streets up, she pointed to the street on the left and asked me to be to, uh, to let her off at a house about a block up the road. I stopped and let her out, and she passed behind my van and crossed the street. Worried for her, I went to the next driveway and turned around to see where she went off to, and she did not go into the house she asked to do it at. Turns out the only thing in the other side of the road from this house was a graveyard. She was nowhere to be seen. Yeah, very formulaic, Aubrey. <laughs> but that doesn't mean it's not true. Um, one of the reasons that these kinds of stories are formulaic is because the same thing does tend to happen all the time. People picking up a girl in white and she, her asking to be taken to a house or to some destination and disappearing like almost immediately after she gets out of the car or something like that. Um, it happens the same way every time. So because it's formulaic, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's a, uh, a fake story or a true story either way, but it does tend to lean to, uh, to uh, lend credence to your story, at least in my opinion. So thank you for sharing that, Aubrey. This next one comes from Emma. Hi, Darren. I've been thinking about sharing these two related experiences with you for a couple weeks now, maybe for a Fireside Frights episode. English isn't my first language, so I'm sorry in advance for any errors. Feel free to edit as you wish. Okay, here we go. I moved into my one-room apartment of just about 20, about 312 feet uh, square in July last year. The apartment's located on the ground floor and has two windows. 
one smaller window in the bathroom just above the bathtub, and one larger window in the main room opposite to my bed and computer desk. My neighbors are wonderful people, ranging from a young family with small kids to a middle-aged lady that eats pizza four times a week. And then there's an older couple living just above me, or, well, it was. About two months ago, the man died at the hospital from natural causes. He was somewhere in his late 80s, and when I met his wife as she came back from the hospital, I knew from the look on her face that something had happened. I'd met her so many times since I moved in, and she was always so cheerful. However, I had never met the man, at least not alive. A couple days later, after he'd passed, I sat by my computer to edit some photographs – I'm a photographer – when I saw a man in the reflection on my computer screen. On my computer screen, that is. I freezed in my chair, watched him as he walked from one side of the room to the other, disappearing through the wall. The hair on my neck stood up at that moment that I knew that he was gone. I turned around to inspect the room. At first, I thought that someone had just walked past my window. I live on the ground floor, after all. However, as I turned around, I noticed to my dismay that the blinds in the window had been shut, which meant that no one could have walked by outside for me to notice on my computer screen, and despite that someone had, clear as day. A couple days later, I had gone shopping and parked my car outside my apartment so I didn't have to walk with my groceries from the parking lot to the door. As I step out of the car, I notice that the bathroom light was on. This was very unusual because I always turn the lights off when I don't use the bathroom. I take my groceries with me, walk inside, and put them down on the kitchen table. After that, I head into the bathroom and turn off the lamp that had been left on, watching it as I turned it off, and then walked out to the car to head back to the parking lot. Just as I'm about to start the car, I turn my head to the left to see that once again, the light in the bathroom was on. I couldn't believe it. I watched to make sure that it was turned off once I headed back to the car. Ever since then, my bathroom lamp has lived its own life. I've had my father come check it to see what the trouble might be, only there is none. I think that it's the husband of the sweet old lady upstairs. I want to ask her if She's been experiencing weird things as well, but I'm afraid that I might upset her. I'd like to think that her husband is visiting her from the other side, making sure that everything is okay and somehow, as my apartment is below theirs, he accidentally turns up here as well. What do you think? Well, you know, that makes more sense than anything else that I could think of, Emma. I, in fact, I kind of like that idea that he's coming to make sure that she's okay and he just happens to accidentally come into your apartment because they're they're attached. That almost sounds sweet. And uh, if I had to think of it in some way, that's the way I'd probably want to to think about it. Because it doesn't sound like there's anything you know um, notorious going on there. And you don't you don't you're not, you're not feeling aside from seeing a ghost, of course, but you're not feeling any like dark presence or anything like that. So. And by the way, um, you do not need to apologize for your English skills at all. You, this was very well written. I could easily understand it. In fact, there were a couple of stories that I had to throw away tonight because I couldn't understand what they were trying to say. There was no punctuation. There was no capitalization. It was just, I mean, you, it could be like three pages of nothing but one long run-on sentence. Um, and I just can't work with that stuff. So I usually end up tossing them and throwing them away. Um, so thank you for uh, thank you for understanding English so well, um, especially with it not being your first language. You've done an amazing job in uh, in learning that second language. You're doing a much better job than many, many English native speakers. So congratulations on that. This next story comes from Ashley. I love listening to Weird Darkness. I've been listening to this show since I was 23, being 27 now. Let me just start by clarifying, I'm not crazy. Anyways, it all started about May 2016. I was a big paranormal fan and curious about Wiccans, being my mom as one, and one day I was googling simple spells that I could try on my own, and eventually lingered into black magic things. Well, I found a spell on how to summon a demon of your own choice. Me being was like, let's try this. All it said it required was a Ouija board, five red candles or four red, one black, a mirror, and then draw the sigil of choice. Well, that night when my mom left for work, I got everything ready and even waited till 3 to 3.30 
too, you know, to make things more spooky, I guess. I read the directions, placed the candles around the Ouija board, and sat the mirror in front of me and the board and said the spell. Now, remind you, it came off a cheesy website that wasn't updated since 2005. Anyway, when everything was said and done, it said the candles will flicker and then you'll hear a low hum and get really cold. Well, lo and behold, all of that was happening. Me being dumb, I forgot to prepare any bargains, deals, or questions. I blurted out, you can feed off my energy if you decide to stay. Well, now, I didn't sell my soul or anything like that. So a week or so passes and I'm staying at my friend Haley's house. I'm cuddling her cat downstairs on the couch while her and her boyfriend and her roommates sleep upstairs. Uh, it sounded like someone was walking in the kitchen and all of a sudden my friend's cat starts growling and hissing and then took off running upstairs. I swear up and down I saw someone just standing there, staring. I rolled over and went to sleep. So another week passes, and I live in Pennsylvania. The area I live in, there's a haunted house and cemetery built in October 30th, 1860, notorious for its haunting. St. Joseph's. But anywhere, anybody here, they just call it St. Joe's. Well, there you get this overwhelming feeling of dread, like you're not supposed to be there. You'll hear Indians yelling and horses galloping, women screaming, and some nights the bell will swing. Well, when we were three friends and I, when we pulled in, I instantly felt euphoric, like I was on the best drugs in the world. And then, when we were in the cemetery, we heard snarling coming from near me, then the galloping was heard. I was getting sick, a, a dizzy feeling, and my, my one friend stopped, or grabbed me, that is, to snap out of it. He was attacked, scratches all down his back, throat, legs. The snarling got louder, I got sicker. My other friend, Patience, clung to me, begging for us to leave, and I don't remember this, but apparently I stood there laughing maniacally, and apparently it wasn't my laugh either. My laugh sounds like Kitty Foreman from that 70s show. Yeah, it's terrible. Anyways, they forced me into the car and I'm back in reality, sorta. I turned to my best friend Haley at the time, which, th with this ghostly white face, and touched her with my cold, clammy hands, and she instantly got a migraine. Scared the heck out of me. A couple days after St. Joe's, I sat my friend down and told them what I did and why certain things are happening. They weren't thrilled. Time skip, August 2016. I'm babysitting my twin niece and nephew, there were two at the time. I went and got, a, got them a sippy and when I got back, their wide eyes were peeled behind me and my niece goes, who dat? Flash forward to November 2016. My two friends and I were experimenting with things that we shouldn't have been, and we went to my bedroom, which is three rooms from the living uh, over from the living room. We were praying something creepy wouldn't happen, but it did, and they sent me into my living room, and I kept hearing tapping on the mirror, and as plain as day, I heard, do you really believe in God? Chilled me right to the bone. Now I go on about all the creepy things that has happened since uh, he's been there, but that's so long. Things I've learned since having him is he's strong enough to kill, killed my little brother's cat because my brother called him out, he moves things and can manifest. His face makes you question everything you've ever known. It's been about six years now having him with me, and most friends kinda accept his energy around. I think mostly out of fear. In my opinion, I feel he's mellowed out, recently moved into a new house with my childhood best friend. He does not harm my cats, but messes with my roommate's dogs and bearded dragon. I've had to hang a rosary in the doorframe of my roommate's son's bedroom and paid the price for that. Also, to this day, we don't use his actual name. We refer to him as Mr. Not-So-Nice to avoid conflict. He seems to feed off people's bad energies, especially mine when I'm upset. My friends and I have a theory that he travels through mirrors to make visits to them, like an unfriendly pop-in hello. Sometimes he even warns me to get out of a situation. Ever been murkled by a demon? It's unpleasant. Okay, Ashley, um, creepy story, weird. Uh, I think you're fooling yourself. And I mean, you said that you, well, I, I didn't say I, like I sold my soul or anything like that. Yeah, uh, maybe you didn't specifically use the word soul, but you did invite a demon into your life to suck your energy. I mean, what? How close can you come to selling your soul than that? You've invited this into your life, and 
I know that you wanted this. I mean, your mom was a Wiccan, and so you were already familiar with, you know, with, with some of this stuff. You went out, you got the Ouija board, the candles, the, uh, the mirror, and your sigil of choice, whatever that was. So you knew what you were going into with this. You knew that you were going to be asking about something from an entity. Now, don't fool yourself into thinking these entities are good. I've never heard any of these stories where, this, where the, this, they're actually good entities. Ghosts are a different story, but I mean, we're talking demonic stuff here. If you're, if you're using a Ouija board and stuff like that, and you're inviting something to feed off of your energy, there's nothing good about that. And to say that he's mellowed out, um, no, he's, he's fooling you. Demons don't mellow out. I don't see that happening at all. Um, there was also something else in here that you had mentioned. Oh yeah, do you really believe in God? Honestly, I don't even know that a demon would say that. So that's where I'm kind of torn here because I do believe that this is a demon that you've invited into your life, but I don't believe that a demon would say that. And the reason that I have come to that conclusion that a demon wouldn't say, do you really believe in God? They don't want you thinking about God, period. So the whole concept of them saying or asking the question, do you believe in God? That's immediately going to bring God to mind. And they don't want you thinking in that direction. They, they want you as far away from God and Jesus as humanly, as well as spiritually possible, I guess is a better way of saying it. So I really don't know what you're dealing with, but it's not good no matter what. And I really don't under, understand why you haven't done something about it. Um, and I, and I can't tell you how to get rid of it. I've, I've never messed with a Ouija board, never will. But, I mean, if it's feeding off of your negative energies and it's feeding off of the negative energies of your friends, which is, which, which you kind of, kind of, uh, you know, kind of say here, you need to do something about this young lady. You really do. Um, talk to a, I don't think Sage is going to work for you on this either. I think this is, I think you're way beyond that. I think you're going to actually have to get some spiritual advice here. Get uh, either an exorcist or some sort of, um, sort of, uh, I don't know. I, I say exorcist because, you know, being the religious guy that I am, I immediately think towards, you know, getting a pastor or something. But personally, I would, I would take, I would go into the house as a Christian. Again, this is as a born again Christian, I would come in with, with oil and I would be, blessing the house with oil and making the sign of the cross over every door and window and at the, at the whole time praying you know jesus move this spirit out of here you aren't it's not welcome you know that kind of thing but if you don't believe in that i don't know what you would do i don't i don't know how the sage thing works but you need to do something uh you you cannot continue with this ashley um i am really glad that you're listening and you've been listening for so long and the reason i'm spending so much time uh after your your uh, letter here, your email is because I care. Um, I am scared for you, Ashley. You really need to do something. Um, and I don't know, again, I don't know what it is. Look into, ask your mom. Um, I'm, I'm, I would never go to a Wiccan, but you obviously would. Go to your mom, ask her, hey, what would you do if you were in this situation? How would you get rid of this? Uh, but find some help somewhere. You, you really need out of that. Um, before I move on, let me get a, a sip of drink here real quick. That's just a scary, scary story, Ashley. <clears throat> okay. Um, let's see. This next story comes from Taylor. Uh, hello, Darren. My name is Taylor, and I've had a lot of sleep paralysis episodes. Well, there you go. Another story with sleep paralysis. Uh, I've had episodes where I am face down and feel like I'm suffocating. Those suck but they're nothing compared to the episodes with hallucinations. I've had too many episodes to count, so I'll just focus on the two scariest ones. Due to this first story, I no longer keep a mirror in my bedroom. The mirror that I had was viewable from my bed. When this episode occurred, I, of course, was unable to move or speak. I saw a red hooded figure that appeared as if it was making its way from inside of the mirror towards the outside. It was as if it was walking towards me, there were flames all around the figure. I felt extremely sinister, as if this being was going to hurt me. This one terrified me the most, because I only have ever seen shadow figures. As soon as I snapped out of it and returned to reality, I grabbed the mirror and threw it out. 
The second one that stands out is the time I seen more than one figure. This time I was unable to move and I saw a shadow figure on top of me. Sort of like the old hag that many report seeing, but mine was a large, shadowy figure. There were multiple shadow figures surrounding my bed during this episode, all just staring at me as I was trapped under this large figure. Once I snapped out of it, I was not able to get back to sleep that night. Anyway, big fan of the show, especially the Fireside Frights episodes. Listening to your podcast and hearing about other people having issues with sleep paralysis has made me feel way less crazy. I wish you and the show many blessings. Well, thank you, Taylor. I appreciate that. Yeah, you're not alone, as we were talking about earlier with sleep paralysis. And your situation, your particular experience is very similar to what mine was. I only had the one figure, and I, I've never really, never really called it a shadow figure, but you could, you could kind of see it that way because it was, even though it was pitch black in my room, the blackness of the figure was so much deeper that you could definitely see it. Um, but it was, but you were seeing nothing. I mean, you, you were like seeing through it into the abyss of eternal darkness or whatever. It, it was really hard to explain, but the outer side, the outer parts of it, the, you know, the, the shape of, of this figure was, was more demonic. Um, I picture it having red eyes, but I think that's just because I put that into it after the, after the, the fact. I don't really think that at the time that it had eyes, I think it was all just pure pure black and the and it was looming over me it wasn't on me like your, yours was like it wasn't laying on top of me it was looming over me i didn't have to really look very far down down the bed you know it, like it was at the, it was at the foot of my bed but it was so tall so huge and like like it was kind of bending and looking down upon me um that's that's the feeling that i had i didn't have any other any other figures in the room with me but yeah um so that that's that that was mine Regarding the red hooded figure that came out of the mirror and it had flames around it, I mean, that almost sounds like the caricature of the, of the devil that, that uh, people draw in cartoons and stuff. And that, that particular image isn't scary, but if that's what you would expect the devil to, to be, then I guess it could terrify you. I mean, if it's coming, if, if you were stuck in bed, if you can't move, you're already terrified because of that, and then you see that particular figure, I can understand why that would be scary as all get out. Um, uh, I guess in my rational mind, I would say, well, that's not the devil. The devil's not going to come at me wearing wearing a red cape and, and black boots, carrying you know, carrying a trident and and have the have the, the black goatee and have fire around him. I mean, that's just the this is a stupid cartoon cartoon devil, but. If that's what you've grown up with, and you and you see that as the devil image, then yeah, maybe so. Wow. Um, anyway, I hope that never happens to you again, uh, reg regardless of of which one or any other. So sleep paralysis is just one, of, just the most terrifying thing that's ever happened to me. Moving on to a story from Janira, or Janira, and I, I don't know how how to pronounce your name. I'm very poly I'm very sorry about that. Uh, this story also has uh, a lot of words that are not in English. Uh, it's, it's written with uh, a lot of Spanish in it, and I flunked the Spanish in my seventh grade, uh, first quarter of seventh grade. So <laughs> I'm gonna, I am going to butcher these words, uh, and I apologize in advance for that. But anyway, here we go. For from, uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say your name is Genera. Anyway, she says, "Hello, Darren. I'm a big fan of your show, and I just, I just like you mentioned." Uh, be in Fireside Frights, Volume 11, Weird Darkness. I also found you during the peak of... If, uh, oh, I see. She she found the show while listening to a Fireside Frights episode, Volume 11. I get it. Okay. Anyway, she says that she found us during the week of uh, the peak of COVID, but it wasn't that I hadn't already been listening to podcasts, but I had just finished a different podcast that didn't have any new episodes. So while browsing, I found yours. And since I'm interested in strange and weird stories... I scrolled to the bottom and hit play, and I have been listening to you almost religiously for the last 10 months. While I wash dishes, do laundry, clean the house, while running errands, while driving, things like that. I laughed so hard that episode, but I get how you were trying to figure out why so many people uh, started during the COVID uh, crisis. But if you think about it, it was a time where everybody had to stay home from work, and that's a time where we had honestly also to find a way to get away from the people that we were stuck with at home. You can only feel stuck for so long before you want to scream. This pandemic has kept us home, and for some, like me, being stuck is not always an option. 
So your podcast, among others, became my getaway. I appreciate you and all that you do. I currently live in Connecticut and enjoy your podcast so much. Highly recommend it. Now for one of my stories, so I'll give you a little bit of background about myself. I'm Puerto Rican female in my late 30s. I've had several experiences with strange, um, I guess I'll call them, incidents, which, which if I manage to type up this incident correctly, I may just tell you about my other stories. Growing up, my family lived in Jamaica, Queens, New York. In Jamaica, Queens? Oh, is Jamaica, Queens an actual place? When I first read this, I thought Jamaica and then Queens, New York, but I don't think that's what you're saying. I think you're saying Jamaica, Queens, New York. Okay, it, you know what? I got my phone here. I'm going to look that up real quick before we go, before we continue on. Because yeah, now you got me wondering. I'm going to be... I mean, I could continue telling the story, but in my back of my head, I'm going to be thinking, what the heck is Jamaica, New York? Or Jamaica, Queens? Jamaica, Queens, zip code. Sure enough, that's a real place. Okay, I've heard of Jamaica. I've heard of Queens. Never heard of Jamaica, Queens. All right, hey, you learn something new every day, even if you're the narrator of the podcast. Okay, <laughs> moving on. Uh, so, okay, so growing up, my family lived in Jamaica, Queens, New York, and I had aunts and uncles who were big into Santiera, which is uh, Spanish, the way of the saints, the most common name given to a religious tradition of African origin that was developed in Cuba and then spread throughout Latin America and the United States. San Santiera, is that right? Santiera? Is that, am I even saying that right? San Santeria? Sa Santeria, that's, how, that's the way it's said. Okay, I'm sorry, folks. Um, had aunts and uncles who were big into Santeria, which is Spanish, the Way of the Saints, the most common name given to a religious tradition of African origin that was developed in Cuba and then spread through Latin America and the United States. Santeria was brought to Cuba by the people of the Yoruban nations of West Africa, who were enslaved in great numbers in the first decades of the 19th century. It's believed that access to the Orishas can be arrived through various types of divination. One of this divination I witnessed multiple times as a child. I must have been no older than six years old. The divination was called the crowning ceremony, which is when the symbols of the patron Orisha are placed on the head of the, devo of the devotee, and he or she may enter a ceremonial trance and become a medium for that Orisha, Orisha, whatever, however you say that. The ordinary consciousness and manifest that of the Orisha, oh, the ordinary consciousness and manifest that of the Orisha patrons. Through the bodies of their mediums, the Orishas are believed to interact with the congregation directly and heal and prophesy for those who approach them. Well, my family didn't do it at a church or somewhere more private. My mother, when felt that she needed advice or whatnot, would take us for a drive to my aunt's house. This was back in the late 80s. I remember their house like it was yesterday. There was this one time when we got to their house, my mom would knock, and my aunt answered pretty fast. We came into a mudroom with a red rug. We turned to the right and went through a door that led into an open layout where there was a huge living room, but it was gloomy and dark. Back then, it was tradition to get money from our elders. The older they were, the more you would get. I didn't like going to my aunt's house because it was always dark and scary to me, but what kid doesn't love money? I'll explain. Mom would tell me and my older brother, who at the time was eight years old, go to my uncle, whose room was on the way to the kitchen, and say hi, while she and my aunt would go have some coffee and catch up in the kitchen. I would look at my brother and ask him to knock, because he was older and could knock harder than I could. I don't remember my uncle's face, it's a bit of a blur, but my brother knocked and our uncle opened the door. Bendicion tío. We said to him, he replied, Dios te pendiga, which how most Hispanic children greet and get greeted in return from most elders, even still today. And before I continue with the story, again, I apologize if I butchered those words. Moving on. My mother exchanged words with him, and he handed us money. I got $5, my brother got $10, because he was older. We then said goodbye, and he shut the door. My brother went to the living room to watch TV, and I walked to the kitchen. My mom and aunt were having coffee. I showed my mom my money, and she smiled. I asked to use the bathroom. My aunt told me that the bathroom was at the top of the stairs, and one of my other uncles, uh, one of my other uncles was upstairs, not to worry if I heard anything, it was just him. I walked up the stairs, and the walls were those ugly wood planked walls. I got to the top of the stairs, and straight ahead was the bathroom. There were three rooms upstairs. The first room, which was right next, right next to the bathroom, and the light was on, and I could see a table to sit, and there were two chairs. The room looked like a somewhat waiting room, per se. I decided to just go to the bathroom before exploring the rest of the upstairs. After coming out of the bathroom, I heard 
something coming from the third room. I knew it was the third room because the first room was still empty and the second room was dark with the door open. The floor was rugged, so I thought I could creep closer to the room to sneak a peek. But as I tiptoed toward the door, the floorboard started creaking and I got scared and stopped to see if my uncle had heard me. No one came out, nor did they say anything. As I stood, it sounded as if there were two people talking in the room, but Tia said only Tio was up there, so he could be so who could he be talking to? As I stood like a stone statue, I could hear the deep voice of the second voice. My uncle's voice was a soft but stern type. I stepped back again, the floorboard creaked, the talking stopped, and I decided now was no longer the time to be nosy. I quickly went downstairs to go sit with my brother. I told him what I had heard, and he told me that maybe he was watching TV. Well, it didn't sound like it was the TV, I explained. He didn't care to hear it. He just wanted to be left alone while he watched his shows. I heard my mom and aunt heading toward the bottom of the stairs. I ran over. Ma, where are you going? My mom looked at me and smiled. I'm going up to talk to your Tio. I need to help him. Uh, I need him to help me with something. Can I go up with you? I'll sit quietly, I promise. Please. But she looked at me and said, go sit with your brother. This is adult things and children should be, should be seen but not heard. <clears throat> Excuse me, but not heard. So please go sit with your brother. Well, I nodded and walked away. Once she was upstairs, I think, it must have been like 10 minutes, and I decided to go up. I crept up the stairs as quiet as I could be, and I poked my head around the corner of the top of the stairs. I could hear my mother as well as my uncle's. I could see my uncle's feet, and I could see my mom's feet, so I know that there was only two of them in there. But the first few minutes, it seemed like a normal conversation among two people. I could hear my uncle telling my mom in Spanish that they were ready to begin. My uncle started humming and playing a drum, talking in a language I didn't understand. At that moment, I was giggling because it looked so funny, but I was sure to be quiet. Suddenly, my giggle was stopped instantly when everything went quiet. Nothing but dead silence. The hair in my arms started to stand, and I felt as if someone was standing behind me. I turned, but no one. All of a sudden, the deep voice that I heard earlier started speaking in Spanish to my mom. I froze and slowly put my head around the corner. My mom's face was like she was just talking to my uncle, but I know the voice that was speaking was not his. The deep voice used words that we don't use even now. Whomever was speaking was old. I could hear the deep voice telling my mom, why do you walk around the house barefoot? Do you know with all the negativity in your life, you can attract evil spirits and they can enter through your feet when you're at your weakest? So please don't walk around the house barefoot and put on socks." My mom nodded and agreed. How does he know that she walks around barefoot? As I was thinking on how he knows, my attention was brought back to their conversation when I heard Ian Nina. It was just me and my brother, so oh, La Nina, La Nina. It was just me and my brother, so La Nina had to be me. I could hear my mom asking for protection for me and my brother. He told my mom that I already had protection because I was blessed uh, as a baby and that it might make itself known since I was a sensitive one. I was terrified and could not move. My brother came up behind me and asked me what I was doing. I screamed. He scared me. My mom came running out. We told her I fell going up the stairs. She gave us the look of, if you don't stop your stuff, I'll whip you when we get home. We quickly turned around and ran to the living room. As we sat there, I thought of telling my brother all that I had heard, but he already didn't believe me from earlier, so I didn't bother. We continued to go back throughout the years and always the same, upstairs and done. Eventually, we moved away from Queens, New York, and as I got older, that's when the really creepy stuff started happening. That'll be a story for another time, which I look forward to telling you. Oh, come on now. That's not fair. Genere, you say that's when all the really creepy stuff starts, and then you say, I'll just tell you next, next time? <laughs> what are you, setting up a Marvel Universe? And, you, and at the end of every movie, you have to have a like a, like a stinger, so, something to let you know that something else is coming on? You do not play fair, young lady. So, so did you ever discover whether or not you were actually a quote-unquote sensitive one? Whatever that means. I'm kind of curious as to... Uh, as to what brought that about and whether or not there was any reality to that. So if uh, if you're listening and you hear that, uh, let me know. I'd love I'd uh, like to know. My th my uh, 
throat got really dry on that one. Let me get another sip. Okay. Uh, okay, this next one comes from Levi. <clears throat> Hello, Darren. My name is Levi. I am a robotics engineer and began listening to Weird Darkness about two years ago, which I continue to love listening to whenever I'm working. I suppose this may be because I come from a long line of Jewish mystics and rabbis, and unfortunately, due to some heavy occult activity, my family has taken part in the past, uh, part in, in the past, I've had a numer- un let me let me say that again, I apologize. Um, due to some heavy occult activity my family's taken part in in the past, I've had a number of encounters with the paranormal. You and the weirdo family make me feel a little less alone out here when these, when these encounters do occur. Recently, however, I've been dealing with a series of events that, frankly, have unnerved me and my girlfriend for years. For some background, I tend to travel across the U.S. for work, but destroyed my ankle back in January, which required us to move back in with my mom for the time being, till I can walk again. Excuse me, until I can walk again. Uh, for the time being, I have a knee roller to get around the house. My mom's house is located deep in the woods on 43 acres up by Camp David and the Raven Rock Presidential Complex in Maryland, so there's almost nobody around. The events began a few weeks ago, when, late at night, we hear a woman talking and the sound of someone walking up and down the stairs, only for nobody to be there. While odd, we chalked it up to pipes, the house settling, etc. A few days ago, it really escalated. My mom had left for church, and my younger brother went out for a date with his girlfriend, leaving my girlfriend and I alone at the house. Because she's been taking care of me in my current injured state, as well as taking care of all the big chores around the house, I decided to write her a love letter, showing just how much I appreciate her and planned on leaving it on my pillow for when she woke up. While I was writing it, I heard the voice again, this time unmistakable as a woman's voice as if coming from just the next room. I still couldn't see anyone and knew nobody but the two of us were home. Still, I chalked it up to tinnitus or something of that nature. As I was sneaking back into our bedroom, I noticed my girlfriend was awake, ruining my plans of surprising her. She still loved the letter, though. She gave me a great big hug and then things really took a turn. What did your mom want? She asked me. I was a little confused and asked her what she meant. She laughed and continued, when you were in the doorway. She was standing directly behind you before turning around and walking upstairs. My heart nearly stopped. I informed her that we were the only people here and asked if she's certain that she saw my mom behind me. Suddenly terrified at the implication, she told me that she was so close her head was hidden behind my back, but she could clearly see my mom's slippers and that mom was wearing lavender pants and a pink sweater. Armed with an AR-15 and a Gerber knife, we immediately searched every room in the house, every closet, under every nook and cranny, fearful that we were in the middle of some bizarre home invasion. The dogs were acting strange and hiding, but despite our best efforts, we found nobody. The phone call with my mom confirmed what we'd already known. She'd never left the church. She was never there. For the past few days, a new symptom has appeared in the form of a recurring nightmare. In it, I am in a well-lit condo in the middle of a bright and sunny day. My mom wants to talk to me in private and asks me if I'm secretly married to a woman named Diviana. Perplexed, I tell her no. She insists that a woman named Diviana keeps calling her, claiming that we are married. I push back and insist I've never met a woman named Diviana, let alone married one. My mom looks at me, sighs, and says, Diviana is here. She's on the balcony. I think you should talk to her. The door to the balcony is a French door made primarily from glass. In contrast to the bright and sunny day in every single one of the other windows of the house beyond the French doors is nothing but pitch black void. When I wake up, I feel like someone's crushing me, like something's invading my mind and body with icy tendrils. I hear a woman's voice and see a pale figure floating beyond my bed. I pray until she goes away. This isn't our first brush with the paranormal. Another one of those encounters involved a hat man that was haunting Martinsburg, West Virginia since my great-grandmother summoned him by mistake in the 1920s, and which my great-grandmother insisted was the devil himself, though I disagree. And we do have a Class A EVP of that encounter, but I'll wait until I have access to our recorder again, which is in storage for that story. 
The situation, however, is a very different one for us, as I have no idea from where this entity originated. Is there anyone else who's experienced anything similar or had any encounters with an entity named Diviana? Diviana. I have no idea exactly how to pronounce that, but that's freaky that it would be so specific that you actually remember the name. I've had I've had dreams of, you know, other people coming up to me and in the dream like I recognize them, but I really don't know them from real life. But I would I don't remember anything that specific like at the name itself and then waking up and still remembering that name to the point that you could actually write it down later on and share it with the, with the, our audience here. That is weird. Um, I am going to, while I'm doing this, I'm just going to look up Diviana on my phone. I'm just kind of curious. Is that even a real, I've never heard that name before. So D-I-V-I-A-N-A, -A, that's how you're pronouncing it, or that's how you're spelling it. Um, of, okay, Diviana is a, a, uh, a genus of snout moths. It was, <laughs> it was described by Ragonaut in 1888 and contains the species the blah 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 okay all right so it's a moth um I doubt seriously that that's what we're looking at um there's also a okay there's also a uh a music artist by the name of Diviana or at least I'm seeing that on Spotify so it could be that maybe you had overheard that name sometime in the last couple of days before you had had that dream you just didn't really recall it and maybe that's where it creeped in. I mean, if it's something that people listen to, if it's a, uh, um, it's a brand new selfie times. Okay, there's a Diviana series on Twitter, but it's a Russian language. Diviana has luxury interior experiences. It was, uh, was founded in 2004. Oh, in his love. Okay, Diviana is a guy in this in this situation. He's an artist. What does the name Diviana mean? All right, this will be interesting. Um, let's see, let me click, click on that. This is from names.org. Um, it's a Latin name and how to pronounce Diviana. All right, let me see if we move this up to the, uh, to the microphone, see if we can hear this. Diviana. 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 Okay, so they're saying with a, with a short A sound, Diviana. I'm looking to see what it means and they're not really saying it on this. But you hate those sites that say, find out what such and such means, and then you get there and it's just a whole bunch of links to other stuff they want you to buy. Meaning of Diviana. Um, origin of Diviana unknown. Well, thank you so much for wasting my time and wasting the time of all of our Weird Darkness listeners. Thank you so much. Okay. <laughs> Uh, that's something else that I could I could just edit out, but I'm not going to because I'm sure you like you guys like to hear me stumble over my own tongue and feet as I do stuff like this. Um, but that's very interesting, uh, Levi. Um, and it's interesting that you have that that uh, that background, the 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 Jewish background, and some of that stuff uh, follows you with the Jewish mystics and the rabbis, and so that's brought some occult activity into you. I'm not familiar enough with the Jewish religion to know anything about the Jewish mystics and rabbis. So I don't know what kind of occult activity that um, that involves. So that's kind of interesting to, that you you brought that to us here. Just something new to, uh, you know, to listen to. I was kind of, a, I, was, I was a little bit jealous of you there for a little bit on that 43 acres up by Camp David in Maryland. I mean, 43 acres by yourself in, in a gorgeous area like that until you started doing the hauntings, at which point, no, I'm not interested. Never mind. <laughs> okay, moving on. Let's go to a story from Patrick. This is a very short one. Hi, I had a visitation one night in a motel room that I rented for one night in Arkansas, of all places. It happened maybe 10 years ago. I don't talk about much because nobody believes me. Semi-long story, short version. 11 p.m., stone sober, all alone, no camera, of course, turned off lights, pitch black for half a second, and then a six-foot-tall entity was standing in the room made out of soft white light. Looked like an angel or alien. Light the room up. I could have read a book. I froze. And then he walked over and sat on the other bed, four feet from me. I dove under the covers till the room went dark. Scared the crap out of me. That's the basic story. Well, I got nothing for you on that one, Patrick. <laughs> You're all over the place on that. The room is dark, and then it's and then it's light. You think maybe it's an angel or an alien. 
and then you jump under the covers until it gets dark again. So I really have no idea what on earth happened to you on that. Okay, this next story comes from a friend of mine, actually, uh, Spooky Boo. She is another podcaster. She has a podcast called Spooky Boo's Scary Storytime. But she was so sweet and decided to go ahead and send me a story for Fireside Frights. So, uh, Boo, if you're listening, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And I do encourage folks to check out Spooky Boo's Scary Storytime. She did not pay for that. I'm just doing that because she's a sweet gal. Okay, so here we go. For the first few months, the house seemed pretty normal. But then one night, my son came screaming down the stairs in what I'd call a night terror. I assume he woke up from a nightmare and it just kept going. He finally took a deep breath and said, I was sleepwalking, I'm okay, and then went back up to his room. And then the weirdness started. One night, I was down in the basement doing laundry, and I heard a small child's voice behind me say, Hi there. But when I turned around, no one was there. At that point, we started finding toys in the basement in obscure places. My first thought was that the children who lived there before had hidden them in the crevices in the walls. Then one day, I noticed a box of old marbles appeared where I had just cleaned. None of the toys belonged to my kids. I also set up a cheap dollar store alarm system around the office area so I knew when the kids would sneak into the office to try to find birthday and Christmas presents. Little stinkers. They did it often. One day when I was in the bathroom, the alarm went off. I yelled from the bathroom, hey, get out of my office. Well, since my son and I were the only ones home, I heard him yell from upstairs, I'm not in your office. As time went by, we could hear a piano playing at night that I thought might be the neighbors, and sometimes the lights and ceiling fan would go on and off. I blamed old lighting. The front door would sometimes open if not double locked. I told the woman who owned the home before the new landlords bought it as our kids were friends. She told me the reason why she put the double lock on the door is that someone would open the door at night. And the reason she finally sold the house is because of all the weirdness surrounding it, including the piano. After that, we started looking for another place to live. It was during this time that really strange stuff started happening. My kids would feel like they were getting pushed up the stairs when going up, and then one night my son was asleep in his room, he heard an old woman's raspy whisper from the closet saying, I'm going to kill you. The kids would see shadows of figures going from our back porch area to a small building that, belong, that uh, belonged to the old house next door that was supposedly a candy store that burnt up inside years before, but the outside remained undamaged. All of this point, uh, at this point that is, we moved. <laughs> I don't blame you, boo. Although, man, what an opportunity you, that you've missed. You had toys coming out of nowhere for your kids. You could have kept those wrapped them up for Christmas, and suddenly, there you go, a whole bunch of really old toys for Christmas that you didn't have to pay a dollar for. Assuming that they would still be in the boxes. Who knows, if they were if they were presents from ghosts, then maybe after you boxed them up and put them under the tree when they were opened, the presents would be gone, they disappeared. I don't know. Anyway, I'm sorry, I just, I thought there was a missed opportunity there somewhere. Uh, okay, this one comes from... Pat, this is my last story for the evening as well. Let me get one more sip real quick before I jump into our last story. Okay. <clears throat> you didn't hear her, but my bride came out and brought me some, some new water. And this one, she said she put some orange vanilla in. I don't know, it's from a company called Clear Theory, I guess. It's all right. Trying a whole bunch of different flavors to see which ones I like best. Okay. <clears throat> like you needed to know any of that. Okay, last story for the evening. This is from Pat. I lived in a mildly haunted house for about seven years. I thought you could use this for one of your Fireside Frights shows, but feel please feel free to use it however you need. I was a single dad raising two daughters. When their mother and I divorced, I fought for and won full custody of them. They were one and four at the time. About ten years ago, when they were in high school for financial reasons beyond my control and for reasons I'd rather not disclose, we had to move to a much smaller house. We went from an almost 3,000 square foot, three bedroom, two bath house to renting a much smaller two bedroom, one bath house that was about 1,400 square feet. Wow, that is a step down. Dang, Pat. 
Um, our very first house was about that size, 1,400 square feet. Actually, I think it was like closer to 1,500, and that's that's tiny. 3,000 much better. Okay, anyway, Pat continues. The new house was small but charming. It was almost 100 years old, and although about the size, about half the size we were used to, we made it work. The plan was that my daughters would share a room until my oldest left for college in less than a year. Our new house was in one of our historic neighborhoods. This neighborhood was amazing. It had large, beautiful, similarly aged homes, and it also contained several multi-million dollar home historic mansions. I'm talking about the 8,000 square feet and larger. These were exceptionally big houses. I was really proud to live there. The house we were renting was literally the last house on the last street in that neighborhood. For an older home, it had been kept up well enough but still needed some TLC. It had a lot of appeal built-in bookcases, arched entryways between rooms, 12-foot ceilings, awesome doors with glass knobs, amazing trim and woodwork throughout the place, hardwood floors and plaster walls and ceilings. It just don't make houses like this anymore. I later learned in the early 90s that they added the central air conditioning, which is a must where we live. Oddly, the heat was from radiators, which took some getting used to, as it takes quite a while to warm up the house once they're cold. The front door was half round top and was painted green. My kids loved it and said it reminded them of the door from the book and movie The Hobbit. The rent was surprisingly affordable and it had been vacant for a while, so the landlord was very excited that I was interested. Excited to the point that she tried to sell me the property almost as soon as I signed the rental agreement. Although the place was small, it did have a large basement and a large attic. I'm going to be honest, the basement was creepy as hell. When you opened the door to the basement, there was about a foot drop to the top stair, but the staircase was at 90 degrees to the door, so when you open the door, you go down and to the right. The washer and dryer were in the basement, and uh, as was the ancient boiler for the heating system. Luckily, the washer and dryer were near the stairs, so you'd not have to venture very far into the basement often. The basement would always make me feel uncomfortable. The entire time we lived there, my kids and dogs would not go down into the basement without some coaxing. The basement had a very heavy presence to it. It was dark, damp, and it felt very gloomy down there. We pretty much would only go down there to quickly throw a load of clothes in the washer or dryer and then book it back upstairs. There were some shelving units against the far wall in the basement that had junk on it from previous tenants, but I didn't get a good look when we moved in, and they were soon to be buried by a wall of boxes. When we moved in, it was extremely hectic. I wasn't prepared and was working against a deadline. My friends were very helpful, but moving into a place half the size of what you're accustomed to takes some planning, which I failed to do. So once the kitchen boxes and large furniture items were in the correct rooms, and the kids and my bedroom boxes were in our rooms, mostly everything else went to the basement as a staging area to be sorted through later. The day we moved in, as I was unloading the moving truck, I noticed an elderly woman watching from the porch across the street. After a while, she came over and introduced herself. She proceeded to tell me that she was born in the house she just came from and that her grandfather had built several of the houses on our street, including mine and hers. And then I noticed her looking up as in thought and silently counting by closing and then silently counting by closing her fist and at one at a time pointing out a finger. One, two, three, four. Four people have died in your house, she told me, without batting an eye. I was thinking to myself, what the heck, lady, who tells someone that? She proceeded to tell me that three of the deaths were previous occupants long ago when she was little, and again in when she was in high school. We didn't get into the details, but I did confirm they expired in the house. The most recent was from the 80s. Apparently in the early 80s, the house was vacant for an extended period of time and that on one particularly cold winter, a homeless person had broken into my house and had apparently died on the floor in front of the fireplace. We chit-chatted about the neighborhood. I thanked her for the information, and then I got back to unloading the rented moving truck. Sadly, she died not long after we moved in, so I was never able to get more information. I just thought it was extremely odd that she felt compelled to tell me this right off the bat. I remembered when I initially walked through the house with the landlord that there was a rug on the floor in front of the fireplace, but didn't think much of it. 
I pulled my best friend aside when we were in the back of the moving truck and told him what my new neighbor had just told me. I asked him to keep it on the down low for the time being, which he agreed to. We went into the living room, and when I pulled the rug back, I literally gasped, and my friend was like, oh man, that's cool! It was a dark stain on the floor that looked exactly the same shape and size as an adult human laying on his side. My buddy excitedly laid down on the stain and was like, yep, someone was dead right here for quite a while, no doubt about it. At this point, he was completely messing with me as he knew me well enough to know I was getting seriously freaked out at this point. The stain matched his body outline perfectly. I put the rug back and started wondering if I was going to tell my daughters. I decided not to spook them unnecessarily as I was already quite freaked out about this and the conversation that I had with my neighbor. I eventually told them, but it was a few years later. I asked my landlord and she claimed not to know anything about it. It took a few months after moving into the process uh, uh, to process all the boxes in the basement. I'd hastily go down those weird stairs, grab a box, and quickly jog back upstairs with it. Once I got everything sorted in the house and had extra room in the basement to move around, I finally got access to the shelves and assorted junk items that came with the house. On one shelf, there was a large gallon-sized glass jar with a metal twist-on lid, the kind that pickles come in. I thought it, well, what it was full of was sand, but my girlfriend later informed me they were human ashes. She recently cremated her father and showed me his ashes one day for comparison. All the other items were mostly broken and rusted hand tools, but on another shelf, there was also a very old, rusted coffee can with a metal slip on it, on a metal slip on lid. It had a bunch of adult sized human teeth in it. Not wanting to attract any bad juju, I just closed the lid and put the can back on the shelf, and I said out loud, Hey, I'm sorry to disturb your stuff. And then I backed away slowly until I got to the stairs and then ran back up them to the kitchen, slamming the door behind me. I never touched anything on those shelves the rest of the time I was in the house. We lived in that house for about seven years until I met my wife and got married. The whole time my daughters and I lived there, we never saw anything resembling a ghost or shadows, but there were obvious signs that we were not alone in the house. At least once a week, one of us would come home after being away and would smell, t and would, uh, smell pipe tobacco. None of us smoke. It always occurred when one of us were coming home to an empty house. We never smelt it when we were already at home. It would only occur when we would come home after being away. At first, I thought someone might be breaking in while we were away, but we had a burglar alarm that we always used and the landlord had also allowed me to change the door locks. I cannot tell you how many times I would be sitting on the couch, reading or watching TV, and I would notice both my dogs looking at something in the other room. Their little heads would move in unison, as if they were watching something moving from room to room. It would not be uncommon for me to get home late from working or a date and find my kids sitting on the porch with every light on in the house. At first, I'd be like, hey, what's up? Uh, what are you guys out? Why are you guys out here? And they would proceed to tell me about knocks and bangs in the house, doors slowly opening and closing, etc. In the fall and winter, I'd try to explain away the sounds as possibly from the radiators and the doors activity because the house is old and it was settling. But in the back of my mind, I was beginning to think we were not alone. I personally never witnessed any doors moving, but I would occasionally hear knocks and bumps, but not often. At least once a week over the seven years we lived in the house, something would always turn up missing, only to be found later, usually right where it was supposed to be. Keys, cell phones, books, even the occasional can of soda would be there one minute, he'd leave the room or whatever, come back, and it would be gone. A little while later, it would be back. When I was on call for work, I would literally keep my keys with me at all times because of this. On some weekends when my kids were with their mother and I would have the occasional girlfriend spend the night, I remember one in particular left in the middle of the night and refused to come back. I brushed it off, thinking she just wasn't into me or whatever, but she eventually told me when we were sleeping she had got up to use the restroom and was physically pushed into the wall uh, into the hall. She grabbed her stuff and booked it out of there saying not a word. When my wife and I were dating, she would tell me that she was not comfortable in my house, it creeped her out, so we would normally spend time together at her place. We eventually got married and moved into a different house. 
I would mentioned the large attic earlier. It was floored and mostly empty except for a rocking chair that was situated in a way that if you sat in it, you would be perfectly positioned to look out the little round window in the peak of the house, looking into the backyard. I'm not sure what these windows are called, but I, I think it was referred to as an ox eye on one episode of This Old House. Anyway, there was one of these little round windows on the front and another on the back of the house. I'm a pretty big guy, weighing in at 250 plus, and the pull downstairs looked to be old and rickety, not to mention the 12-foot drop, so that's another reason why most all of our boxes went to the basement when we moved in. Long story short, we didn't use or go into the attic, except for two times. Once when we moved in, and again one last time when we moved out, just to be sure the kids didn't put something up there without telling me. Anyway, the day I was moving out, I pulled down the stairs and hesitantly climbed the creaking, flimsy stairs high enough to get my head into the attic to have a look around. That damn chair was now situated at the front of the house positioned so you could now see the front yard. I remember saying out loud, okay then, see you later, and quickly climbed back down and folded up the stairs. My daughters both swear they didn't do it, and I believe them. Fast forward seven years. It's moving day. My girlfriend slash fiance and I had found a place that we both like and are in the process of moving boxes and furniture out of my house and into the truck. At one point during the day, she comes out of the restroom looking pale, with a puzzled and a bit scared look on her face. I asked her what's wrong, and she calmly asked me to look in the bathroom. I look on the floor by the radiator, and plain as day, there are two dirty, child-sized footprints on the tile near the radiator, as if they were standing in front of it. They were about the size of a three- or four-year-old, which really stopped me in my tracks, as I'm a bit of a clean freak and I mopped that floor once we had everything packed and out of the bathroom. She has cute little feet, but they're not that little, and there hasn't been a toddler or any kids for that matter in my house in the seven or so years I lived there. The whole time we lived there, I never felt scared to be there alone, but I also never felt truly alone in that house. It's weird and hard to explain, but I almost felt drawn to the house at times. I still actually kind of miss it in a peculiar way. On my way out the door for the last time, I said out loud, I'm leaving. It was nice living here with you, but please stay here. I think it worked, because I have had no weird experiences since. What a story to end with. Nicely written, Pat. Thank you so much for that. And I think your, uh, I think your landlord there was a blatant liar. Oh, she didn't know anything about that stain on the floor that looks like a person. Right. Sure, sure she didn't. And that's also why she wanted to sell the house to you almost immediately when you started, when you assigned the rental agreement. Yeah, right. Okay. Yeah, she definitely wanted to get rid of that house. And there, there were a lot of stories that she knew about that she did not tell you before you moved in. You know that's true. I have to wonder, I know when you're selling a house, you got to tell, you got to tell, well, depending on where you live. I think everywhere in the U.S. this is the case. I might be wrong on that, but I'm pretty sure that you have to tell the the person wanting to buy your house whether or not somebody has died in the house. And, and I mean, you got confirmation there from your neighbor that four people had died in that house. I don't know if that's the case when you're renting, though. Um, if somebody could tell me that, if you're listening to this and you know the rule or the law on that, uh, let me know. I I'd like to know, if you are renting a place, does the landlord have to tell you if anybody died there, or is that only when you're buying a place? Just just kind of curious about that. Anyway, that is all of the stories that I have for you. No more left to read, and I do mean no more. I have zero stories left for next month. So, if you want there to be a Fireside Frights next month, you better be sending me in those stories. Just visit WeirdDarkness.com, click on Tell Your Story, and send in your true story of anything spooky, creepy, or paranormal that's happened to you or maybe to somebody you know. Also on the website, you can find all of my social media, listen to free audiobooks, shop the Weird Darkness store, sign up for the newsletter to win monthly prizes, and find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression or dark thoughts. If you like the show, please share it with someone you know who loves the paranormal or strange stories true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. 
And please leave a rating and review of the show in the podcast app you listen from. Doing that actually does help the show to get noticed. All stories in Weird Darkness are purported to be true unless stated otherwise. Weird Darkness is a production and trademark of Marlar House Productions. Copyright Weird Darkness. And now that we're coming out of the dark, I'll leave you with a little light. Proverbs 3, verses 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to Him, and He will make your paths straight. And a final thought, life's so short. Spend it with friends who make you laugh and feel loved. And folks, that's exactly why I like Fireside Frights, because I really do feel like I'm spending the time with friends. You make me laugh at some of your stories. You make me feel loved with some of your comments. I really do I truly appreciate all, all, all the emails, messages, and everything else you send me. I really do love it. So again, I would love to, see, to hear more stories from you. Just go to WeirdDarkness.com and click on Tell Your Story. And if you don't have a story and you just want to email me, I'd love to hear from you anyway. Just send it to Darren, D-A-R-R-E-N, at WeirdDarkness.com. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me for another Fireside Frights in the Weird Darkness.